Welcome back to But Why the Podcast, and today we're bringing you some Fantastic Fest 2019 interview coverage. This one is with writer-director Damien Levesque of The Cleansing Hour, a new Shutter original possession film that brings so much to the subgenre. So take a listen. Um, so, and you are the director of The Cleansing Hour, which I got to see last night, and Holy moly, I did not expect it to hit as hard as it did. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, so talk a little bit about, honestly, the concept. So, um, I mean, the idea of blending a social media world and, and switching things right at the beginning of the film and bringing all of that into possession, which is a genre that is, I mean, there's it's very saturated. How, how did you come up with the idea for The Cleansing Hour? Um, well... Have you ever seen a movie, uh, seen um, a clip that's like released on liveleak.com and, you know, it's sort of grainy, low quality cell phone footage and it's of something outrageous and, you know, regardless of anything, you pretty much just accept that it's real. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I've worked in reality TV for a long time and I know how manufactured things in reality TV are. So I basically just took like, that idea of seeing a grainy cell phone video online and automatically believing that it's real, combining it with the manufactured nature of reality TV and my, you know, quasi obsession with supernatural and exorcism and horror. <laughs> so uh, they it just kind of seemed like a perfect marriage. And um, the cleansing hour was born out of that. And I, I want to say, how did you cast the people? Because I mean, the cat, the casting for the priest, and I'm using bunny quotes if you're listening to this interview. Yes. He is extremely charismatic from shot one to like the end, even when he's going through stuff. How did you find the right actor for that? It was a really, it was a very long, drawn out process. We spent a lot of time going out to a lot of different actors um, before we landed on the people who were right for the role. And, um, it, you know, Ryan was, Ryan was very enthusiastic from the beginning. And uh, he just nailed it. He just knocked it out of the park. And then whenever we sent the script to Kyle, um, Kyle just came back with so much enthusiasm for it and said, this is, this is incredible. This is like nothing else I've ever done. Um, and, you know, Kyle also has you know, a pretty... Uh, Kyle has a pretty long horror pedigree. You know, he's been in a lot of horror movies. So to hear him come at this with such alacrity was, you know, really quite quite exciting for me because you know i've seen all these movies um and then the process of casting alex was was a really big deal because it was a very physically demanding role it was essentially playing two roles she had to play lane and the possessed girl um she had you know she has big shoes to fill because there are so many you know possession roles that have been done in the past you know how is she going to do that without sort of just totally ripping off somebody and, um, you know, so it was very demanding physically, very demanding psychologically. And um, it was also sort of a headlining role that, would, that could make or break the movie. Yeah. Um, so we had over 4,000 submissions for that role. We had a phenomenal casting director, Claire Kuntz, who uh, sifted through all of them for us. And when she showed me Alex's tape, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so perfect. It's almost like Alex was in my head when I was writing the lines. And was that's it like, it. was it her doing possession? Like, was she that? was doing the possessed demon. Yeah. Oh, wow. Like, she was doing the, she was doing the whole opening monologue of the demon. And I was just, every tape that I watched after that, I was like, well, it's not as good as Alex. It's not as good as Alex. It's not as good as Alex. So it was pretty easy to narrow it down at that point. And that's when we uh, made the offer to Alex and, um, she just killed it. She and she didn't disappoint. So I feel like I made a really good choice there. And as I mean, just the physicality that she did bring to that role. How much of that was her? It was a real collaboration. She and I got to rehearse a lot together. Um, I because I was walking a very fine line in terms of tone. Yeah. You know, the movie is funny. It does have comedic moments, um, but it also is serious. So I wanted to be very careful to not make the demon into like a game show host. Yeah. I didn't want the demon to be sort of like Mickey Mousing everything that happens on set and, you know, kind of coming across like a, you know, a, a wisecracking Pennywise. Yeah. You know, and that, that would have kind of spoiled it for me. So um, we worked on, we worked on what kind of physicality, what kind of, um, what kind of movements and tone and way of delivering lines can we do that isn't too jokey, but isn't too 
you know, series. So it was a very, it's a great area in there. So we practiced a lot of that stuff, and that way we were ready on the day. And when it came to, because there's like, um, I mean, live, live streaming culture is so big now. Yes. I mean, you have Twitch, you have Facebook Live, you have Mixer, you have everything coming up and all these shows starting. Did you look at any like existing personalities to kind of like build out, um, I guess, kind of the, 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 the in, how do you say it, like the in-universe brand, right? Like the, the personality types that we see that are making the show. Um, did you base that on anybody that you've kind of seen, or was that just all from the, the the care? The, the short answer is that they were they were all sort of come up, drawn from scratch. Um, the the movie is you know an, an expansion of the short film that we made three years ago, and the essence of those characters is basically the same. It's you know you know this 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 arrogant, self absorbed, narcissistic guy and his quote unquote best friend who is the serious one who runs the show and does all the work um, and is ready for a change. Um, those, that sort of remains the same. Um, the, stuff that, the stuff that changed really is once we cast Ryan and Kyle in those roles, um, they, just took the, they just took the characters to a whole other level in understanding like, who they are as people. And that's the amazing thing about having great cast is that they have the ability to give a, a fourth dimension to the words on the page. Um, so we really, you know, in the movie, you can really feel for, for Father Max. You know, he starts out as this really unlikable person who, you know, is a total a-hole. And um, later on, you realize that, like, that all comes from someplace. And that he's a broken person, you know. And Ryan did such a great job at, at just bringing that to life. I will say this. Like, as somebody who went to Catholic school as a kid and grew up in that very Catholic guild, very, like, I saw that, like, I, when I saw his kind of backstory on screen, I was like, oh, wow, this actually hits me really hard, (laughs) and I don't know why, Um, but, like, it it was really good. Can you talk a little bit about kind of building out, like, that Catholic background for him? Sure, yeah, I mean, it was all very heavily inspired by my Roman Catholic upbringing. I mean, I went to Roman Catholic grade school, K through 6, and uh, the school mom, the evil teacher in there, is based on my principal. Um, and it really wasn't that much, it wasn't much of an exaggeration, to be quite honest. Um, I, the little boys at the beginning are drawing a picture of a, one of them is drawing a picture of a demon. Um, I drew that picture for the movie, but it's inspired by uh, a story whenever I was growing up when during Christmas time, everyone was doing an art project coloring gingerbread men. And I gave my gingerbread man horns and, and, and like evil eyes and teeth and got sent to the principal's office. <laughs> principal called my parents. And they came down and they thought it was funny, you know, so it was, it was, you know, I had a thousand stories like that to draw from and, uh, you know, I'm grateful for my, for that upbringing only just because I met, you know, two of my best friends yeah. uh, that way and I'm still in touch with them to this day. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of scary and I think that there, there could be some better ways of, uh, <laughs> of, of raising children that they don't involve, you know, scaring the crap out of them yeah (laughs) i can i can agree there (laughs) um so uh, away from characters you did an amazing job on the characters i want to talk about the creatures all right the creatures are always my the practical effects creature design body horror like that is the stuff that i live for in the horror genre yeah so why don't you tell me a little bit a little bit about how you designed all of that for the sure yeah, I, I, I love that stuff, too. And so going into this, I wanted to make sure that we were doing as much practically as humanly possible. And to be honest with you, I would have done the imps practically, too. But um, believe it or not, cost was a concern and time was a concern because it would have involved um, you know, building an entire suit for a man to be inside. And, and it would have just been added a whole other dynamic. But that's practical effects for you. you know, yeah. It takes a lot of manpower to put these things together. So um, I'll start with the imps, I guess, and sort of work backwards since the imps are the one uh, non-practical effect in the movie. Um, I had this concept that I want to take a devolved angel, basically, that turns into an imp. So starting with human features and then warping those human features down into sort of this quadruped creature that has like skin sloughing off of it and muscles and structure exposed and these weird mandible jaws. Um, making a creature that you haven't seen before. And that was really important to me. Let's make this thing look like something you've never seen in any movie, not even remotely close. I can't just off the top of my head think of anything that comes close to it. Someone mentioned to me maybe kind of a Demogorgon from uh, Stranger Things, but like I made this long before that. So 
So and the translucent skin that they have is something yes. that is extremely unique. Yeah. Like that is because usually when you see those types of creatures, they're super dark, super muddy. Right. Not like almost standing out from everything else. Yeah, yeah. They, I wanted it to feel like they're uh, so fleshy, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that we. We did the we did those and we, we came up with you know you know we made a three D model of them and then the animation team went to work and like bringing them to life, um, but then the other effects like the devil at the end which by the way spoiler alert you know <laughs> uh, I wanted to make a devil that didn't look cheesy like the the man in the devil suit that we're all used to seeing so we went uh, the, the whole thought process going into this like let's make a beast let's make an animal like thing with human features so um that was the basis for that we sculpted a we sculpted this beautiful demon head devil head with the, with the horns going in different directions it's asymmetrical and the devil at the end is 95 percent uh practical we uh, we it's uh you know it is a man in a suit but it looks way more intimidating than just a man in a suit yeah. um and then we augmented the face where we added we added the eyes digitally and we did some heat distortion coming out of the mouth and and then we warped the lips a little bit, but ultimately it's a ultimately it's 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 a practical effect, and even the glowing skin is a practical effect. Really? Yeah, uh, it's a it, it's a it's a luminescent paint when you shine a black light on it wow. and it glows. So um, it's it just it's a really really cool thing. I'm really proud of that. And the way the devil hatches uh, coming out of Tommy's body. You know, Tommy's Tommy was wearing. You know, he, he dies in the fire, and then he comes out. And then you know, Tommy's wearing this burn suit. So we designed the burn suit that was what Tommy's supposed to look like after he catches on fire. And then you know, we took you know pieces of latex and basically ripped them apart over the devil's body with a bunch of goo and like guts and stuff like that underneath it. And it's an effect that works incredibly well when, you, when yeah. the devil is hatching. You know, it totally sells. And it's funny, like. One of the most common comments that I got from people who maybe aren't as into practical effects yeah. as you or I is, "Those are some great uh, CG effects," and like they just don't understand. Like, no, <laughs> like this is that was all practical. So all the devil hatching is practical, and like I, you know, I'm a child of the '80s, and I loved watching Gremlins. That was such a oh, huge, yes. ins- such a huge inspiration for me. And that's all practical. Yeah, all practical, and like the hatching and everything is so great. Um, they, and then, oh, uh, we, and then you know, just everything down to even the smallest things, like um, you know, the fingers being bitten off, and uh, the slashing of the skin, and um, the the neck. You know, yeah. people. I, you know, it, I even I even really learned something because you know, of course, I knew that whenever you do the, the neck slashing, you know, body or uh, effect, that you know, someone's wearing a thing on their neck, but. I never really realized how complex that was until I did it. Yeah, um, it, it's it's a very complex effect where you where the actor has this custom made appliance applied to their neck, and it is made with a uh, it's it's pre slit so that when they bend their neck back, the tubes that are in there can gush blood out. Okay, but it can you have one take? So oh wow! So we <laughs> I had to very carefully. Choreograph the scene and shoot it so that when it got to that moment when he does the slash, we can get that in one take and we yeah. got it. Um, it is it is tough. It is very tough, but educational. Everyone should do that. <laughs> I mean, we had a we had a phenomenal uh, company work make those for us. Um, Amalgamated Dynamics in, in L.A. and they they are terrific. They are like top notch. It was amazing, and, and this is probably a weird word. This is a word that like horror fans would use. It was beautiful to me, like these small <laughs> little moments. Um, and then three stick out. So there's a close up on Elaine's face where there's little tiny bones on her jaw that you can't, if you don't really notice right away until the camera just sits on her for a second. Yeah. And I saw that I was like, oh wow, they're like every little detail. Um, the other one is when Tommy's face sticks to the leg and it just pulls off. That was, that, that, for me, that was one of the moments where I was like, oh, they really went in on these practical effects. <laughs> and the last one, is just the close up of the skin kind of sloshing off the back of the devil. Yes. And I was just like, damn. Like, it, it, <laughs> I, I so thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, like, and thank it was, you. As much as I like commend you for those giant moments, like the devil breaking out of somebody else's body, yeah. it's those like little tiny things that are like, 
they paid attention to every detail. Thank and you. They, it, it, it came across to me as somebody who like actively looks for that. Yeah. Um. So like it, it was amazing. Thank you it, so much. In, in that respect. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to kind of working, I want to talk a little bit about the voice work. Sure. Because the changing of the voices and the imitations that um, Alex's character does, um, how did you kind of, it, it, it's easy to go really hokey with that, but you all right. grounded it really well to where it never really seemed out of place. Right. How did you go about finding the right tone for her demon voice as sure. well as kind of making sure that the imitations that she did didn't come off of, uh, you know, too cheesy? Yeah. That was that was tricky, to be honest. Like going in, I wasn't sure how I wanted to do this because one thing I definitely wanted to avoid was the, you know, the boilerplate. Pitch it down a couple of notches and layer it with another lower pitched version yeah. of the voice. And you know, we did play with that initially, and I was like, it sort of confirmed what I what I initially thought, which was that this is not what I want to do. We have to do something more unique than this. So what's it going to be? And you know, we worked with um, we worked with a sound designer who was just in charge of the voice. And, you know, we looked and we also looked at just doing some, you know, fancy digital filters. And then ultimately, I fell back onto this, uh, you know, the, the concept of dubbing the voice in the same way they did with Mercedes McCambridge in The Exorcist. Um, and I, 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 I had a sort of a dream person that I wanted <laughs> to be cast to do the dub voice. And that was, if you've seen The Little Mermaid, Ursula, the actress who plays oh, Ursula. Oh, wow. It's her daughter, actually. Because she's now retired. Yeah. Pat Carroll is retired. And her daughter, Kara Kossian, uh, is not. And she's actually the, she is the voice of Ursula in the next uh, uh, Little Mermaid series yeah. that Disney is doing. Um, anyway, so we got Tara, and she sounded even more terrifying than her mom. <laughs> and she came in and dubbed all the lines for the demon voice. But we didn't stop there. Because I really kind of wanted to maintain this idea. You know how like Lane is fighting back against yeah. him in, the in the movie? I wanted Lane's voice to come through still at different moments. So it wasn't as simple as just dubbing the voice. We spent a lot of time figuring out beat to beat how much, how much Lane is coming through, how much Devil is coming through, and blending them. And, and we did pitch them down a little bit. We mixed them together. We augmented, we augmented them. It was, you know, it ebbed and flowed with the story. And, you know, when the demon was super PO'd, uh, the, the voice became more, you know, masculine and throaty and, and, and mm -hmm. intimidating. Um, and when it's just talking, like at the beginning, it's more level, you know. Um, so the, the voice throughout is a blend of Alex and Tara Garcian. And um, I am very, very proud of this because I, you know, still to this day, the exorcist is probably the best exorcism movie ever made yeah and you know the voice that they did on that movie the way that they changed the girl's voice was uh groundbreaking at the yeah. time and um i still proudly say that i think that we had the best possessed voice of any movie that I, any possession movie i've ever seen since the exorcist i'm not and i do not say that lightly and, yeah. I, and I say that with the utmost humility and respect for that movie and all the other movies that have come since then but I really wanted something that was unique. I'm very happy that I got it. And I will say, as a viewer for me, like that's why I asked the question. I was like, hey, I, it's I, I, I love the possession subgenre just because there's so many different ways to go with it. Oh yeah. Um, and so like for me, listening in, like those are like the effects, how the body's gonna move, any sort of contortion, how the voice sounds. Those are all like hallmarks. So if you don't get right, can throw something off. And every piece of that of the possession is amazing Thank you. and then the voice was really it was recognizable that you all did more than just we're gonna auto tune this lower yeah <laughs> which a lot of people do right. um so i mean yeah I'm, i feel like i'm just crazy new movie oh, as oh, i interview sorry. I'll take it. <laughs> it was really good it hit like all the little notes in my horror heart looks for good i, I um, love that. that i mean i made the movie for people like you honestly yeah i wanted it to be a, fa a movie that horror fans can love, and it's a total popcorn flick, and that's the kind of movie I want to make, really. And speaking of popcorn flick, like there's like there's kind of two movies going on when you add in the social media element and the yes. comment section that ends up going off because there are a lot of times where like I was wa we were watching this really serious thing happening, and I just see the the most messed up things coming across the side, yeah. and I'm like. It was one of those things which is hilarious as it was in the viewers. Like, oh, that's also something that would totally happen oh, yeah. if somebody People was watching trolls. this IRL. Yes. And 
How did you go about adding that comment section to it? That was a lot of work too. Most of it was done in a couple of sittings where I had friends come over and we got to give them a lot to drink and we just watched through the movie and on a Google Doc we we're all just typing through what would people be saying and they make <laughs> up usernames and they write down the text and then and then we integrated that into the graphics later on and we went scene by scene by scene as what's gonna be what's gonna be on the screen at this time. And uh you know, I, I really try to make a strike a balance between like the people who are watching the show who think it's real and the people who yeah. are just the trolls who are there to make fun of it. And there were definitely moments, I think uh, there's a, a scene where he's talking about how the merch is all fake and you can see that. I think that was for me probably the moment I saw like the best balance of like, I could see somebody behind their, their keyboard like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Uh, how dare you lie to me? And the other one's like, yeah, like, did you not know? Did you really think this is <laughs> real? It, it, there's a there's a charm and a charisma to the film that like I think really comes through and then for me, like, uh, you, the it's going to be on Shutter next year, right? Which I'm really, I, I'm a Shutter subscriber, and I have awesome. been since I found out about it. Um, like, uh, is there a sort of like watching experience that you want people, you know, when they're watch streaming it at home to have? Yeah, definitely. I, I would say that um, make your room as dark as possible <laughs> um, because it's a dark movie. You know, we intentionally yeah. made it, we, we we graded it dark. You want it to be dark because it's more unsettling that way. Yeah. Um, frankly, it, it, it forces you to, um, it draws you in in a different way. There's something very psychological there. Uh, sub, it, it's, it's subconscious when you're like, you can't see everything as clearly as you normally can. And it, yeah. it, I, I love that about, you know, you know, making a dark picture because it, it makes you uneasy. So that combined the uneasiness with the sound and the subject matter, and then all of a sudden it's a different experience. So make your rooms really dark and crank up the volume. Awesome. Um, one last note: the film is also really, really diverse. Like you all have a whole bunch of different locations, I mean, which you're showcasing the audience watching. You know, watching the cleansing hour. Um, what kind of went into picking different locations to be responding and watching? You know, Father Max, and um, really just creating a, a diverse cast. Yeah, sure. Um, well, having a diverse cast is always super important. No matter what I'm making, I want to have plenty of diversity. I want to make sure that you know we're representing everyone equally. Um, and you know, sometimes that's not always possible. The story doesn't allow yeah. for it, but in this movie, it certainly did. So um, you know, across the board, honestly, we we made an effort to uh, you know look everywhere for the best candidates and um, really try and represent different nationalities yeah. as well as possible. So with when it comes to finding the spectators, you know. There's some of them take place during the day, so we were sort of limited to parts of the world that would be daytime yeah. while it's nighttime in LA. So that was pretty much everything from uh, like India through China. Mm -hmm. So we that's that's why we have the the, the, the three guys in Oman, yeah. um, and also we picked Oman because we needed some place where they spoke Arabic, and a lot of the a lot of the countries in the Middle East that don't, they, they won't speak Arabic, or they'll speak a different kind of Arabic. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that was accurate. And then um, Korea was the same way. We want to have two cops who, you know, having lunch. Yeah. Um, that Korea was, I, I chose that because in Korea, the police will sometimes carry firearms. Yeah. So because of the way that it ends with the cops, I wanted to make sure I, it was, I was realistically representing police in that part of the world. And because police in a lot, in, in a lot of Asian countries yeah. don't carry guns. So um, that was purely a, I suppose a story choice. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, and then well, even even in Dallas, you know, we have uh, most of the guys in the in the uh, kitchen are Hispanic. Yeah. Um, and that's actually a really cool story too. Um, we got to work with um, a great organization called Homeboy Industries. I don't know if you've heard of it before, mm -hmm. but um, this is a this is a non for profit that takes people off the streets and basically gets their lives back in shape. They will pay to have their game tattoos removed. Um, they will get them into rehab programs, and then they will also place them into jobs. Well, they also help place people in acting jobs. That's so, awesome. Um, we got to work with Homeboy to cast the entire kitchen. Um, That's where where is Homeboy based out? They're in LA. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. It's a great organization, and I highly recommend that everyone check it out. Yeah. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, I mean, it's great to hear the work. I mean, in all honesty, it's kind of rare for me to see myself in horror films, <laughs> and to be really, really honest. So whenever I come across a film that, like, tries, in, you know, to be out there, be diverse, and, like, showcase different pockets of people who would tune in and people who would, who would you know, watch this stuff, um, I definitely 
That's awesome. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so why, I guess um, that's really all I have. Why don't you tell everybody listening where they can find you, find the film, where they can look for The Cleansing Hour next? Um, the film's coming out on Shredder next year. We don't have an official release date, but it will, will be on Shredder 2020. Um, I'm on Twitter at Damien Levesque and at Damien Levesque on Instagram. And you can also follow at Cleansing Hour on uh, Instagram, at Cleansing Hour Movie on Instagram and at Cleansing Hour on Twitter. Um and uh, I'll, t- I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I have coming up next. Yeah. Um, I've got um, a horror anthology series, which is sort of a Black Mirror meets uh, The Exorcist. It's, it's, that is amazing. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's um, adapted from a book called The Dark Sacrament. It's true stories of demon possession and exorcism. All true stories based in Ireland. And it is, I'm, as somebody who is a huge fan of horror, these are some of the most terrifying stories I've ever read. So I'm super excited to be able to bring them to the screen, and that's what I'm working on right now. That is amazing. I can't wait to see that. Also, I just love anthology yeah. so much. Yeah, um, well, you you will like this a lot then because it's it, it is it's six episodes of you know non connected stories. Yeah, and uh, all kind of dealing with different aspects of the supernatural. Yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and talking with My me. Pleasure, Jake.